Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today we've got on a guy by the name of Sarek, aka Hyperbits. Sarek has had over 50 million streams on Spotify. He's worked with major labels doing remixes for artists like Beyonce and Nick Jonas and so many more. And these days he's teaching other musicians and producers how to get even better at their craft over at the Hyperbits Masterclass that you can check out. If you're interested and you like this conversation with Hyperbits, aka Sarek, we're going to give you guys a code where you can get a whole bunch of free goodies from him, including chord packs and samples and a whole bunch of other stuff totally for free. But really interested to talk to him. We're going to go to a lot of places here about both production, mixing, actually kind of moving forward in the business and creating a meaningful career for yourself out of music. And I think we're going to start an interesting place. It's something I've heard Sarek riff on a little bit in the past. This idea of quality versus quantity when it comes to music production. And I think his answer here is a little controversial at first, but I think it's one of those things that's going to make more and more sense as we get a little deeper into the weeds. Sarek, super excited to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Justin. Before we get into it, real quick shout out to our sponsors for this month. Big shout out and thanks to Antelope Audio. I'm right now speaking into a lovely Axino microphone from Antelope Audio. The most affordable modeling microphone I know of. It's got models of everything from Lecture Voice RE20 to Neumann U87 and so many more. If you want to hear some of the best microphones in history modeled through this microphone, I've actually got a whole demonstration video on it. Check it out over here on our channel. I'll link to it on screen in the show notes down below. They make a whole range of amazing interfaces, many of them with basically zero latency recording through high quality effects, a great line of software emulations of some of the best hardware ever made. So if you're in the market for an interface or a modeling microphone, Antelope is one of your great ways to go. Check them out over at antelopeaudio.com. Also, a big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. They make some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Really some of the absolute best, most fun stuff to use out there. Finally, if you want to sponsor yourself, we've got the full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs and Mastering Demystified with yours truly. They come with a full money-back guarantee. They're going to change the way you approach music production forever for the better. I know you're going to love them. All right, without further ado, let's get right into it. This week's episode with the producer known as Hyperbits. Sarek, really glad to have you on. And let's start off with this controversial question because there's supposed to be a right answer to the question of what's more important in music and music production, quality or quantity. We all know what we're supposed to say, right? But I think, Sarek, you have a slightly different take on this that I think is totally worth hearing. And I think is going to resonate with some people if they really hear you through on it. So give me your perspective on this quality versus quantity in music production. I'm super pumped to be here. And yeah, the idea of quantity versus quality, I think is something that a lot of people sort of like don't fully wrap their heads around. Cause I think there's this story that most people think that like the artist, you know, just goes into this like dark cave or something and pops out with like, you know, a full album worth of material after like hibernating for a year. And so most people think like, oh, you know, I can work on a song for months or I can work on a song for this really long time and keep tweaking it and editing it and changing it. And just like, you know, over and over this like madness of changing something that you've already got that will eventually become really great. And I'm basically the opposite proponent. Like, I think that you can actually only achieve quality through quantity. And I think to like really maybe wrap I don't know, at least for me, how I wrap my head around this was to even think about like the lifeline of a individual project. Like, have you ever read uh, Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon? I have not. It's a it's a really good book. He does a lot of cool kind of illustrations. So it's very visual, very easy to read. I read it on a on a flight, like, you know, in two hours, something really quick. But he talks about the lifeline of a project and how, you know, when you start an idea and you're sitting in your DAW, right? First thing you think is like, ah. Oh, best idea, right? This is the best idea I've ever had. And then you start working on it for a little bit and you're like, you know what? Okay. Like this is a little harder than I thought. Like, you know, you start to kind of like decline in your perception of a little, and then you get into the thick of it. Right. And you're like, oh man, like this is going to take a lot of work. Like this is, this is actually really, really difficult. And then you start to like really doubt yourself and you're like, ah, oh, damn, like this actually kind of sucks. Like what I'm making is just awful. Right. And then we all have like that dark night of the soul, right? Where we mm -hmm. just we just sit there and we're like, what am I doing with my life? Like, why am I even making music? You know, like mm -hmm. you just start to really doubt yourself. 
Uh, and honestly, at least for me in my experience, like the, when those moments arise, like I'm berating myself, like I'm almost angry at the fact that I can't finish something good or create something that I deem, you know, viable. And then, you know, eventually most of us work through that. And then we decide like, you know what, this isn't that great, but I'm going to try to finish it. And then it's done. And you look back on it a few days later, or a few weeks later, and you're like, you know what, it's not that bad. Like, it's not amazing. Man, so much, so much <laughs> of the time you need distance on projects to really understand how good or bad they are. I, I definitely can relate to that experience of working on a project, even not even as a music creator, but as a producer or engineer for other people, the same exact emotional roller coaster happens. When you start working on this project, you're excited about the exciting things in it. You run into obstacles. Those obstacles take the wind out of your sails. There's this high hat that's annoying you or whatever it is. And then you've worn yourself out so much on this project. By the time you get to the end of it, you're like, is this even any good? Does it just <laughs> totally suck? And then you're like, okay, well, we're done with it now. And then you go back months later. You can't bear to listen to it again, but you listen to it three months later and you're like, oh, it actually wasn't bad. We did pretty good. But you have to go through that emotional turmoil of self-criticism to make something good. Like you have to totally. be this terrible critic of yourself to some degree to keep on getting it better. But this puts you in a weird emotional state where you can end up thinking it's not good enough or it's not finished or it can never be finished. But then once you get some distance and you listen back, you say, well, that's actually probably the best we could have done at that time. What were we so worried about? Totally, totally. And, and I actually think that the biggest difference between really the professionals and the amateurs really is just that they have tools, like the professionals have tools in place or systems in place to basically get you through that emotional roller coaster in a better, more, you know, efficient way. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people that sit down just think that like they should be able to create easily. And it's just, it honestly isn't that simple. And if you allow yourself to like, you know, get down on that process and slow down on that process. Like how will you ever practice or flex that muscle of creating a lot of music? Like that's kind of going back to this quantity over quality concept. Like the way to achieve music that actually sounds professional and sounds, you know, commercially viable and all those things is to practice the process of the whole part of music creation, whether it's composition, mixing, mastering, right? Like the whole thing needs to get done. And if you repeat that process enough, Every song, every opportunity, or every song is an opportunity to basically get better at the whole process. Um, and I don't think it can honestly get done that like if you just sit down and make like one or two tracks or three tracks a year. I mean, I was one of those people for a while. You know, I spent spent years just making like three songs here, four songs there, and it wasn't until I actually started working with some management who, um, actually, some of them were working for for Universal at the time and. They had a little, you know, side catalog of artists that they were working with. And they basically sat me down and they were like, all right, we'll manage you. Like, we, we really like what you're creating. But the agreement is you have to finish one track every single week hmm. while we work together. It doesn't, it can be a remix. It can be an original, whatever, but like one song a week. And I thought they were crazy. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, that's not how artists work you know like that what do you mean and they just they taught me about deadlines and they taught me about how the music industry like sometimes you get an opportunity and it comes in really late and they're like yeah i need this in 48 hours and if you mm -hmm. can't sit down and make a track in 48 hours you know like you're gonna get you know left behind you're gonna get kind of uh picked over by someone else who can so it was a really incredible learning experience and really taught me that yeah you can you can work faster and it doesn't jeopardize you know, the quality of the music. If anything, it actually helps you uh, achieve quality. I think that's a really brilliant idea because the only way you get good at anything, really, really good at anything is doing it again and again and again. And that's one of the things that I try to focus on as well in my courses and mixing breakthroughs. It's all about becoming more efficient so that your finishing rate goes up. Because I was, again, in very similar case when I was mixing and producing, my finishing rate was really low. I'd slave over things. You'd go back over decisions again and again and again, where you're not going over making it better or worse anymore. You're going over making it different. And when you're given time constraints, all of a sudden, you're really made to zero in on what's most important. You start to develop a kind of big picture perspective. And then just the sheer quantity of doing it again and again is what's going to make you good. Because 
you can imagine a couple of different producers, one who has produced three tracks in the past year, slaving over each of them, and one who has produced 35 tracks in the past year. Who is, A, more likely to be doing better work at the end of the year, and B, who's more likely to find opportunities with those tracks? Because I, like right. you said, in, in the music business, unless you're going to be a big major artist, which is difficult, but even if you want to be a big major artist, a lot of your earliest opportunities are going to be collaborations. And when you're doing collaborations, you're working with somebody else's timetable. And that pressure, I think, and those time constraints can often actually bring the best out of you. Did you find that in your world, some of your best early opportunities were collaborations where people had you under a deadline? Oh, totally. I, it, it's actually kind of, you're, you're sparking some memories of just, you know, like some little moments where I, I actually remember my first official remix opportunity for, uh, it was for the American authors uh, who was on Island Def Jam at the time. They're kind of like... Uh, you know, just like a folky indie type vibe. And I really actually liked some of their music. It was kind of like Imagine Dragons type stuff. And um, I, so I had this remix opportunity and they told me they needed it in 24 hours, which I was just like, how? Like, what you know? What I, and I, so I sat down and I tried to create this like incredible remix, right? I tried to put a lot of added pressure on myself because, hey, it's for a major label. Like it has to be really good. And I actually got to that dark night of the soul in that night because I was just like, sitting there, I'm a few hours into working and I'm like, man, I've got nothing, nothing exciting, you know, nothing that I'm proud of. And I literally Googled like something ridiculous. Like I was like, how to make music on a deadline, you know, just like trying to figure out what to do. And, uh, and I came across some forum somewhere where someone was just writing about how, like when they struggle, they just come back to like being simple. Like what people most enjoy in music is really a chord progression, right? Or a simple melody. Like you don't always need to reinvent the wheel. And I think that these are the little exercises that present themselves to you when you're faced in these short deadlines that like the idea that you create is going to present itself to you. You can't force your way like through it or into it. And yeah, I just found time and time and time again that these little deadlines and these little moments would just kind of bring, you know, the best out of me or force me to just figure out solutions, which then I used, I had that again and again, kind of in my toolkit moving forward. Yeah. I've come to really appreciate that idea of keeping things fresh. And now I really appreciate deadlines. As a mastering engineer, I'm always working on somebody else's timetable these days. That's most of my work. And sometimes people will say, Hey, Justin, can I send you some tracks in advance so you can listen to them Give me feedback on them. Tell me if they're ready for mastering. Tell me what needs to be changed before they get mastered. And then I can re revise the mixes and send you new ones. And invariably, I tell people like, no, I, I don't have time for it. What I do have time for is I'm going to sit down right now with the record that you have done to the best of your current ability. Because I believe right now you've done everything to the best of your current ability. I'm going to do the best of my ability to master it and make it sound as good as it possibly can be based on what you've given me. Now, at the end of that, if we listen to it and we say, this is great, but something's holding back this record. And it's like, your hi-hats are too loud. Your vocal's not loud enough. Um, there is too much kick relative to the bass, or you have this build up at 80 hertz. Then I can give you that feedback. But I'm A, only going to know if I actually sit down and try my best to deliver it in this time frame. And then we'll bake in a little bit of window at the end. So in case revisions come up after that, we can go back and tweak something. But it makes it less nebulous and it makes it like, no, we're doing it right now. And if we need to go back a step because we discover something, we can go back a step. But 80% yeah. of the time, the people who ask that very question, they said, oh, it was done. It just needed to be mastered. Now it sounds great. And the other 20% of the time when I'm giving them some feedback saying, hey, this is as far as I could take it, but you're really going to love it much better if you finish this in the mix. I was only able to really know that because I dug in and tried to do the job. And if I just thought about trying to do the job instead of actually finishing the job, I would never know because I wasn't digging in. And uh, I think that that kind of thing uh, happens. I think there's an allegory to that in, in every stage. Of yeah. Production. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really an exercise of of surrender or letting go, right? Like I think perfectionism plays this really huge role in basically like that, like that artist that is asking for those, you know, preemptive edits is essentially a perfectionist. And we all kind of relate to that. I think like, we, I don't think most people would get into music if they didn't have a little bit of that, like artistic uh, taste, right. Or that, that desire to create something beautiful and just, you know, uh, close to perfect. Right. Cause we hear other artists do it, but 
at the end of the day, right, I actually believe that perfectionism is kind of a, a curse. It's it's something that is basically saying like, hey, I'm not okay with releasing this out into the world until I have completely and utterly like double checked everything, you know, crossed all the T's, dotted the I's, whatever that expression is, right? Like it's saying that I'm not ready to let this go until I've done everything in my power to like try to make it perfect. And in reality, a song is never actually done. It's just something that you eventually have to let go of. And that's not to say that you don't want to try. It's not to say that you don't want to like put in the effort, but there is a fine line between like, it's almost like diminishing returns. You know, eventually you do sort of just have to let it go um, and trust that, you know, you've done everything you could in the time that you had it to make it as good as you can. And then your engineers or the other people in the room who are contributing to it will also do that in their best light. Yeah. I think there is this interesting psychological bit of warfare we play with ourselves where we're telling ourselves when we can't finish something, it's because we're not good enough and we want the person who we mm. could be in the future to be completing today's project. But it's like, that person doesn't exist yet. Don't got the time machine. <laughs> and the only way to get to that person is through projects. Like there's not just time, but projects between you and that person who you want to be, who you wish was in your chair right now. Uh, so be nice to that future person by finishing more projects now so that future person is an even better place and is even better at their craft. So I really like that idea that yeah. uh, quality versus quantity, the best path to, to quality is through quantity. Now, I would say that one of the differences is that back in the day, that quantity phase was often done behind closed doors where yeah. bands would spend years like workshopping in front of, you know, club audiences, or they'd be doing demos and, that would never get released into the public. Whereas now our process of discovery and development often happens out loud. And this is a thing that can maybe mess with people a little bit. It's like, you don't have an audience yet. You're just at the beginning of your craft, but you want to get your songs out there into the world. Like, do you wait a really long time before you do that? Or do you develop in front of an audience? Do you have any perspective on that? At what point you should go public? Do you go public early on and just have the guts to say, early stuff isn't going to be as great as my favorite artist, but what the heck, I'm going to get it out there. Or do you think that there is an incubation period that people should go through before they start finishing publicly? You know, it's funny. I, I actually don't believe that there is a correct answer to this because I have seen both models work for different types of artists. And I think you have to kind of pick whatever resonates more maybe for you as an artist. Like, do you want to go through that really intense learning period where you are releasing kind of as you go and you see different tracks getting different responses or different songs getting different responses? And that can be a really valuable learning experience, right? Because you're basically on the front lines and you're seeing what works. And truth be told, right, you can always go back and remove some of these releases from Spotify if you really wanted to, right? So that option does exist to you. But there's something to be said about that artist who just sits down and decides like, hey, I'm going to make an album worth of material and I'm going to shop this around and, and you know, wait till I'm like a little bit more ready to actually start releasing. And I've seen that method work as well. It honestly, it really depends on like what resonates more with you. Because if you do, let's just say you do make a song and you sign it to a label or self-release it, like the first thing that either the audience or the label is going to want from you, right? Once that gets released is the next song, right? <laughs> so there's something to, to be said about having a little bit of a catalog that like is in your back pocket. So you can actually take a little bit of time to, um, you know, to sit down and, and, and create music, like not on someone else's schedule. And this actually kind of plays a little bit into, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert wrote this book called big magic. She's the one who, uh, wrote Eat, Pray, Love. She's super mm -hmm. famous for that. But she wrote a book about creativity. And the gist of it is that, well, there's a lot of points inside that book. But one of the points related to what we're talking about is that she never wanted her art to be dependent on income, right? Meaning she was like happy being a waitress off on the side, making her living that way. So that when she was able to make artistic decisions, it was based on what she felt was right, not a decision based on how can I make income right now? Mm. So I feel like this idea of like setting aside a little bit of art, you know, and releasing later on does play a little bit more into that perspective, right? Because then it's like, hey, I can take my time. Like I can write something or create music 
on my own agenda, on my own time where my music or my art is not dependent on like a new release schedule or trying to uphold some sort of content that I'm trying to get out there, right? Like you can slow down a little bit and it is a marathon at the end of the day. It's not a race. So I know it's the most cliche thing mm-hmm. ever, but again, both methods have, you know, have things that are totally good about them. But I think if I had to pick, I'd probably lean towards that, like, you know, hold off a little bit and, and build up that catalog and then release later on. Right, right. But if you are doing it behind closed doors, still that idea of having quantity behind closed doors to get you to that place where you're like, now I'm in a place where I feel like I can execute. So maybe giving yourself self-imposed deadlines while you're still in that incubation phase is still big because how are you going to know when you're ready? One of the points you're going to know when you're ready is when you say, all right, I'm going to go through this exercise where I produce, you know, one track a day for 12 days or, you know, one track a week for 12 weeks or whatever it is. And then you say at the end of that, hey, those last few were pretty good. And if I can just put out that quality and that speed now, let's let's start doing this thing and uh, let's start coming up with release strategies. And I think that's the next big thing is release strategies, but that's another side of things. I think right now we're mostly focusing on the craft. Maybe we'll get a little bit more into making sure your stuff gets out there as an artist. But I think the thing that um, I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper with, with you is in the craft, getting better at making interesting sounds. So one of the big questions I have for you is, what do you think is unique about your approach to teaching people? Because not only have you been a successful artist in doing this with you know 50 million plus streams on uh, the streaming services and working with some pretty big artists doing remixes and working with some pretty big labels, you're now teaching people especially the craft aspect of it at the Hyperbits Masterclass. What do you think is your unique angle? What are you teaching people that they're not going to find elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, a few things come to mind. Like, uh, I think that a lot of educational institutions out there and courses and things like that kind of start you literally from the ground up where they're, where they're teaching you, you know, the basics of Ableton and or, or Logic or Pro Tools, whatever DAW you're using, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's awesome if you found an educational resource that teaches you from the ground up. But we actually don't focus on that really, really at all. We kind of expect that people get into our school having covered that stuff, you know, just on their own or had taken a different class or something so that we get to kind of move a little faster and focus more on like the intermediate to advanced stuff, which the niche that I think we expose, which again, this is like based on just me as an artist, like when I was working, like as, you know, coming up as a producer, like, I felt the one thing that I couldn't find and was struggling with was, hey, I've gotten my music to like 50% or 70% of maybe what the pros are doing. It's half decent. It's not awful, but it just doesn't have that like that commercial polish. It doesn't have that that shine to it, right? It doesn't have that commercial viability. And that's kind of what we focus on the most. Like we expect that you're already creating some sort of vibe or some sort of sound, right? That that you're somewhat excited about. And then what we do is, you know, take you from that like rough, raw, uh, you know, kind of demo type sound and bring you up all the way to professional, essentially radio quality or radio ready music. And we do that by not just, you know, the technical stuff, like we're super technical with, um, you know, our mixing strategies, uh, how we apply processing chains, how to think about the whole track as a, you know, as, as a holistic thing. Um, but we also help a lot with the mindset, you know, like that's kind of what the quantity over quality thesis is, right? It's how do you approach making music? And so I think the mindset component of it is a really big thing. You know, there's a lot of different strategies that we teach that just get you into that mindset and, and ability to actually finish music. And there's a lot of specifics inside of that, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I'd say that's kind of the big like differentiator yeah. if I had to say. I think that's one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you is because I think so much of that is aligned in, in both of our approaches. For instance, in, in mixing breakthroughs, I focus on some of the same stuff that you're talking about. It is primarily a mindset course rather than a technical course. All those technical ideas, just like you said, the idea is what are the mental barriers you have in your own head 
that keep you from succeeding? What are some of the bad workflow habits that you've gotten into that keep you from having a high finishing rate and keep you from working quickly and efficiently and staying creative? And how can we get that stuff out of the way so that you can be more creative? Now, in mixing breakthroughs, I focus only on mixing, mastering, and mystified. I focus only on mastering. But I think in the Hyperbits Masterclass, you're a little bit more holistic, right? Are you taking it from the generation of stuff all the way up to final mix, final master. So you're kind of, you know, uh, snout to tail making songs over there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, something that comes to mind, like as far as, uh, I guess like common misconceptions or things that I think people put unnecessarily unnecessary pressure on themselves for is something as simple as like sound design, right? Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, we do, we do teach a little bit of sound design and, and music theory all the way through mixing into mastering, but someone, like, I feel like a lot of people come into the school thinking that they have to create every sound from scratch or they feel guilty for using sample packs or guilty for using uh, sound banks of different synths and things like that. And I'm not saying that you can't learn synthesis from scratch. We do teach a little bit of that, but it's a much more like, you know, overarching simplistic view, because if you really were trying to be a sound designer, right, that in and of itself is its own like career pursuit, right? Like you can sit there, you basically run into what? The time devotion problem, the quality of sound problem, right? Like your your job as an artist is to make art, right? To make songs. And how can you really do that if you're spending hours and hours learning or creating sounds from scratch? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe once in a while you can do that. And if you're not feeling creative, like there's nothing wrong with having these like separate sessions to maybe do a little bit of sound design but you're never going to be able to make sounds that sound as good as the professionals who are creating this stuff. And then what it becomes is more about how do I get access to those tools? How do I know what sounds are actually of high quality? What sounds can I actually like rely on through creation and through the, you know, sample pack companies and, and through networking and collaborations, like finding those sounds that, are actually of high quality that kind of make up a little bit of who you are. And we, we talk a lot about creating something, something so simple, just a favorites folder. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, just buy these sample packs and they just endlessly go through them. It's like, no, like every time you make a song, sit down, take that, that little clap snare combo that you spent 47 minutes one day, like tweaking that you really like and save that down into your favorites folder. So that when you make a track in the future, like, you can reuse some of these sounds and you don't have to use the same sounds over and over and over again. You can always decide intentionally to create new sounds in the future, but something as simple as a favorites folder helps your workflow exponentially because it's not, you're not always in sound finding mode, right? You don't yeah. always want to be cycling through claps or kicks or things like that. Sometimes you just want to be composing, right? Or writing melodies. And it's tough to do that when you can't just like get an idea down nice and quick with good quality sounds that you're using. Right. And you'll do other things to them. So the idea of recycling samples, I mean, you have to remember, I mean, like an 808 is literally like one sound that's been used. Like it's a sample that's been used on like yep. how many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of records. But in context, you do little different things to them. So if you have, let's say you gave yourself the challenge, I'm going to make an entire record using only three snare sounds they wouldn't necessarily sound repetitive. I mean, you're going to be, the context changes, the additional effects you're applying to them, reverb or delay or whatever else you're adding totally. to them, uh, EQ changes, changes in saturation, you know, maybe pitching them up or down slightly to the tune of the track. You could make an entire record using a relatively small amount of samples, but not feel like you're running out of variety. And in fact, a lot of early sample-based music didn't have, you know, tens of thousands of samples to draw upon. Totally. So getting into like modes where you're kind of, how can we take the same general color, this general piece of our palette and apply it in several different ways? I mean, sometimes limitations like that are, are creatively enhanced. Yeah, there's, there's freedom. There's free, not to cut you off, but there's freedom sometimes from restrictions, yeah, you know, of by putting these, these uh, kind of uh, constraints on yourself, you can actually feel like, oh, I can actually focus on the things that matter, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and even if you did use, you know, the same three snares throughout an album, like, yes, there'd be all these different 
uh, I think components to it that would make them so slightly different anyway. But even if they did sound a little bit similar, like that just helps you create a little bit of a cohesive sound to you as an artist, right? So there's there's not really that many negatives to uh, to using those types of, I guess, similar sounds in your own music. Yeah. Now we started off a little controversial and then ended up, you know, smoothing it out a little bit. But I think I'm gonna have to cycle back when we get controversial again. I'm gonna ask about your opinion. In 2021, right now, this part of the conversation might become irrelevant and dated in a number of years, but Unison MIDI Chord Pack, Unison MIDI Chord Pack, Unison MIDI Chord Pack. You, sir, even have a video about Unison MIDI Chord Pack on your channel. Um, this in case, uh, you're seeing this in the future or you have like ads turned off somehow and you've never seen this ad on YouTube. It <laughs> comes up on my videos constantly at every music production video. And it's people are like, this is amazing. There's a chord pack. And then you, it makes the song for you. And I've seen videos like yours. You're actually not harsh on it. And you, you talk about some of the use potentially in having chord packs are drawn. I've seen other videos extremely critical of this particular one. They mostly come from people who I think have good music theory background. And they're like, it's a D minor. You're selling me a D minor. It's like, well, not everyone knows what a D minor is. Uh, I, I've heard people complain that there are better chord packs out there. If you're going to go for chord packs, you can get a lot more out of you know some other ones and more variation and all that. But that's been a controversial area where some people really like drawing on these things. They simplify the process for them. Some people absolutely hate the idea of using pre-made chord progressions or even dragging chords from a folder into your piano roll. Can you give us your perspective on this? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, personally, uh, I, I don't really understand why anyone would complain about what anyone else is doing. And this goes way beyond even just music production. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I really, I forget where I heard this from. It might be from a Tim Ferriss podcast or something along those lines, but it's the idea that like no one doing anything greater than you is ever going to be complaining about what you do. <laughs> you know, I really believe that. And, and if someone does really have a problem with like specifically like the unison MIDI chord pack, like to me, it actually is a great way to bring in some variety into your production. Because for me, you know, I am somewhat classically trained in music, you know, like I played a little bit of violin growing up. I played guitar and, you know, I've like, I, I think about music in a very specific way. And so when I go into a DAW and start composing and writing melodies, like I'm finding that I have actually got more restrictions based on, you know, my life experience and how I learned music then when I go into these mini packs and think like, oh, there's all these other chord variations and, uh, you know, inversions and things that I completely either don't know or just forgot about or, you know what I mean? So, so when I open up something like the Unison Mini Chord Pack, yes, they are selling me a D minor at times, but they're also selling me every single inversion and every single variation of that chord that I don't know, right? And that allows me to experiment and use my ears and be like, I, I think a lot more of a creative artist than I would be if I didn't have those tools in front of me. Um, mm. And the mini chord pack, uh, I think that you're referencing, you know, it's a very simple, low cost pack. It's, you know, it's just something really meant to basically be every chord and every key, right? Just like laid out for you to play around with. But they have some am amazing other packs that, uh, you know, are specific to genres and they're great learning tools. So if I wanted to learn how to make chord progressions specifically for, I don't know, uh, house music versus like, uh, emotional dubstep. Like not that I make that type of music, but mm -hmm. the different genres of all these electronic music, you can kind of go into these different chord packs and use them as tools to further understand composition. And I feel like that's nothing but a good thing at the end of the day to be able to learn that way. It doesn't always need to be from scratch in a classical sense. Like <laughs> actually the one thing that's also coming to mind is, uh, have you heard of that like goat farming meme? Nope. Sorry. I'm going to Google this real quick and see if I can find I thought it. I was up on my memes too. Let's see. Goat farming sample packs. Let's see if I can find this. Okay. I'm going to read this. this. This is, I think it's worth it. So I thought using loops was cheating. So I programmed my own using samples. I then thought using samples was, cheat was cheating. So I recorded real drums. I then thought programming it was cheating, so I learned to play drums for real. I then thought using bought drums was cheating, so I learned to make my own. 
I then thought using pre-made skins was cheating, so I killed a goat and skinned it. I then thought that that was cheating too, so I grew my own goat from a baby goat. I also think that's cheating, but I'm not sure where to go from here. I haven't made any music lately, what with all the goat farming and all. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> now, and I think that I actually have read that one before, but uh, it <laughs> is a good one. And I think it's interesting, you know, I like the idea that you bring up about these things potentially being great learning tools. Like if you did want to learn music theory, not that everyone has to know music theory to be great writers. I mean, Paul McCartney famously talks to this day about how he doesn't know music theory and doesn't know one chord from another. I think to some degree, he probably exaggerates uh, his, his ignorance of it. But if you wanted to learn that stuff, what better way to do it than make a study of a genre and find, hey, what are the most common chord progressions in the genre? What are the most co common structures, A, B, A, C, you know, and to analyze those things, like that's what people are doing when they learn music theory is they're picking these things apart, analyzing them and learning from them, from them. But theory can be a wonderful tool, but it's applied theory that's interesting. And uh, applied theory means going in and making music, making interesting sounds with whatever's available to you. And different generations and different genres approach that differently. I, you come from a little bit more of an electronic background, at least more recently in your career. And I think there's a big curatorial aspect to electronic music in general. Like it's a curatorial art form. You're creating, but you're curating, you're bringing from other sources. We're bringing samples from other sources. We're bringing ideas from other sources. We're bringing potentially chord progressions from other sources and we're curating things. But if you really think about it, that's what rock musicians and jazz musicians are doing as well. I mean, a jazz musician is curating through listening to and potentially learning countless years worth of solos that they learned and you know countless yep. uh, records and players that they studied before them. And they are to some degree borrowing and stealing and curating what are the things that were coolest that they heard on other records and how can they communicate that through themselves. And I had one professor in college who said it very well. It's like, people your age, you're all going to be too interested in expressing yourselves. And here's the thing, you're going to express yourself no matter what. You can't help but express yourself. You are a unique human individual. Everything that you do and everything that you process is going to be filtered through yourself. You don't need to obsess about expressing yourself. You're just naturally going to express yourself. So get doing some stuff. And one of the best things you can do is try to emulate other people and fail. You look at the Rolling Stones who were trying to emulate, you know, black blues musicians, failed miserably and turned out to be the Rolling Stones. Uh, <laughs> Kurt Cobain credits trying to mimic what he thought punk rock sounded like, having barely ever heard any punk rock because it was hard to get your hands on those records, failing miserably at sounding like, you know, 70s and 80s punk records and turning into Nirvana. So we're always curating but, uh, well, I, but I like, but, to, like, I like I, that I, idea you said of not knocking the way other people are doing things. <laughs> yeah, because, because again, like I really think that everyone's got, or not everyone, but a lot of people have a chip on their shoulder for whatever reason. And it's mostly a, a case of just either being jealous or, or just maybe not doing enough themselves and being too focused on what other people are up to. But to reference that, that book again, Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon, like it's an entire book about how there essentially are no completely original ideas. Every idea that's ever been written is basically borrowed or cultivated off of something that someone else was inspired by. And that's one of his recommendations in the book is to like, not just study like your, you know, influences, but like study your influences, influencers, right? Like who were those people that your favorite artists were inspired by? And if you start looking back everyone's attached, right? There's, you could kind of like draw a mental map of all the, your favorite artists and how they were inspired by all these other artists and they're all influencing each other. And like you said, even if you do try to create the same exact thing as someone else, like a lot of times you just fail miserably and then you've actually got something that is kind of unique to you. I mean, I've done that tons of times and no one even recognized the fact that it was, you know, directly influenced by some other artist. So right. yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day, I love coming into, uh, I guess, like music with a perspective of just, hey, like we're all just trying to create art here, man. Like we're all trying to chill and have fun with this. Like let's not focus on who's taking what from what and let's just, you know, enjoy the music, right? Like that, I, I know it sounds again, a little cliche, but 
there's just no reason to to be so like i guess negative or uh pessimistic about these types of things sure fair enough it's hard enough and, you know music is hard enough as it is <laughs> yeah I hear you. now one more uh question for you you've been really generous with your time today i don't want to take up your whole day but uh i want to get a sense for what are some of the approaches that you teach people over at the Hyperbits Masterclass as far as like an order of operations? Because I do believe that to be creative, you need some type of system. There's not just one system that works. There's probably multiple systems that work. I have one that I teach in Mixing Breakthroughs that people can adapt uh, for themselves in mixing. I have a different one for Mastering Demystified. But I feel like if you have a system, an overall kind of roadmap, a structure for finishing things start to finish, you can tweak them. But if you have that roadmap, it becomes much easier to have a repeatable process in which you can be creative. Do you have a general order of operations that you think is best for the track creation side of things that you can give us a synopsis of? Is there more than one approach that's effective there? What are your thoughts about the best ways to be creative fast with composing new music? We actually don't teach one specific approach to this specifically because I think everyone does have a little bit of a different... um, you know, just, uh, I guess, way or or workflow that could work for them. Yeah, different systems can work for different people, but everyone see, who does it a lot seems to develop something like a system or a few different systems and they pick which one they, they use based on that task of that day. Yeah, like like for me, I, I love to start with melody, right? And, and chord progressions specifically. So for me, it's like I, I can start with chord progressions. I don't even need a drum beat or anything, but that's not to say that you can't start right with like a bass and kick and just get mm-hmm. a groove going that way. So what we actually kind of do is is give students who take our class basically an option of like 15 to 20 different ways to start music. And we encourage you to just go like go through them all, like learn how to do all of them, but then pick the ones that inspire you the most or make you feel uh, maybe the most, uh, at ease when creating. Um, cause yeah, generally speaking, like we do showcase, you know, a system across the whole spectrum of creating music, but it's not something that's like cookie cutter and just like, Hey, do steps A, B, and C. It's more like, Hey, here are all the steps and here's how you think about all those steps. And here's how you can go about replicating this and bringing it into your own workflow. Cause the idea is not to create a replicate version of me, right? right? The idea is to like, hey, here's here's how you, here's your unique like beauty as an artist. Here's something super specialized to you. So let's run with that. And like, maybe you're a master uh, chord writer, but maybe, you, or maybe this other guy makes the most intricate drum patterns I've ever heard, right? Let's figure out like what you're good at. And then we can use that to create a workflow that is sustainable and allows you to finish music consistently and regularly on a deadline. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, for people who want to go deeper with you, you do have a link full of free goodies. We're going to share it down in the description in the show notes down below. You can check that out. It's an exclusive VIP link for listeners, viewers of the Sonic Scoop channel and the Sonic Scoop podcast. Uh, what kinds of stuff uh, do people have in store there at that uh, toolkit? Yeah, we got some really, really cool uh, stuff that we put together. So we were just talking about MIDI packs, right? And so we actually have 300 MIDI chord progressions from famous songs from the past 10 years. So, Ooh. you know, whether it's a pop song or electronic songs in different genres, like we'll just give you 300 chord progressions that we sat down and just transcribed so that, yeah, you can use this as a learning tool. And hey, you can't copyright a chord progression. So True. if you want to just straight up take them and use them in your music, you can do that too. But I would encourage you to mess around with them and play around with them to make them your own. But that's one of the things in there. We're also going to be giving you uh, 200 plus like vocal samples so that you can play around with vocal leads, vocal atmospheres, vocal synths, vocal chops, uh, organic percussion loops as well. I think there's over like 300 of those. And then we're also going to give you, just so you get a little bit of a sense of like, kind of our style and what we're all about in terms of our actual education, we're going to give you like a series of music production explained in two minutes. So eight different videos showcasing all the major things about music production that'll get you kind of like, I think, up to speed and thinking about music in a very different way. Um, And we'll also give you some free learning guides, you know, just like PDFs, like 50 technical mixing and mastering tips, like specifically like what moves, you know, what frequencies we're doing. So you can try replicating those for yourselves. Uh, as well as, you know, 
Eight Secrets to Finishing Music, which is like a 10 page PDF that talks a lot more in detail about some of the things that we were talking about today. So there's a few other things in there that uh, I didn't quite mention to uh, keep it short on time, but it's a good, it's a good pack. I, I definitely recommend uh, downloading it and it's, and it's free. So very cool. No reason not to. All free. You got a special exclusive link down here in the show notes, whether you're on the video version on YouTube or on the audio only version over at the Sonic Scoop podcast on iTunes or they call it Apple Music these days. I sound like a fuddy duddy when I say <laughs> iTunes. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm changed. showing my the age. Game has changed. Uh, but you can find on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or uh, whatever purveyor you like. You should find it in the show notes there as well. So definitely check them out. Hyperbets, Sarek. Thank you so much for being here. If people want to uh, keep up with you online, what are some of the best places to do that? Are you active anywhere on social media or is your site the best place? Uh, yeah, I'm active. And uh, I think the best, I mean, everything is, so hyperbits.com or Twitter. I, I actually tweet out uh, music production tips every day uh, during the week, Monday through Friday. So you can follow me there. Instagram, you know, if you want to check out, you know, the food that I eat and the, you know, workouts that I have and the occasional music production posts, follow me there. But yeah, hyperbits.com or Twitter or our YouTube channel. Uh, and yeah, we're posting pretty regularly on all those. That's right. You got to check out his YouTube channel as well. We'll link to it uh, here in the show notes and probably up here on screen in the outro as well. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Big shout out and thanks to our sponsors this week, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Also big thanks to Antelope Audio sponsoring the podcast this month, talking to a lovely Axino modeling mic, the most affordable modeling mic ever made. Got some lovely models. I think I'm talking to the RE20 model right now, but they've got a whole bunch. They've got Neumann's, uh, M149 and U87 and all that fancy stuff, AKGs, a whole bunch of great stuff you can switch between. And you can hear me go through all the models in this mic. I've got a demonstration video about it. Uh, also check out their line of interfaces and plug-in effects, making some great stuff over at antelopeaudio.com. Big thanks again to Sarek, Hyperbits for joining us here on the Sonic Scoop podcast. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time. Thanks for having me.